right, thank you very much, folks. Thank you for coming uh, to see me today. I'm going to talk about flushing away your preconceptions of risk. Now, risk is a tool that I think is primary in any InfoSec manager's arsenal uh, that they use. It's incredibly important. If you know how to use risk properly, if you know how to measure it, etc., you know how to apply it, you know how to uh, resolve it, then actually <clears throat> you're going to deal with a huge number of, of issues within your organization. But it's also one of the most misunderstood things, I think, in my experience you know, of, of working with it. Before we start, a quick disclaimer. Um, none of these ideas are my companies, they're my own, so therefore, when you love everything at the end, it's all my own work. Uh, there is no alternative. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I'm going to say is that I'm, I'm amazed, as, as you can imagine, you know, certainly with an image like that, I've done a lot of searching on Google Image for good quality uh, art and uh, imagery and photography, and I'm amazed at the quality of that, that that's out there. You know, when you're searching, you know, quite a defined search term, you know, such as, you know, enigmatic, good-looking gentleman, for instance, you come up with some amazing stuff, I have to say. So, let's move on to the agenda. So, first of all, we're going to look at our interpretation of risk, how we actually perceive it in the first place. Then we're going to be looking at how we measure it, because it's one thing to actually understand it, it's another thing to try and measure it and see where you're going from there. And the third thing is how we effectively treat it, or rather how actually in many cases we don't effectively treat it. So moving first, moving on, the interpretation of risk. Now, if I was to ask anybody here, you know, what is the riskier, uh, a coconut or a shark, what's the answer? Right, exactly. We all know that coconuts kill more people a year than sharks. Except if you're British. Except if you're British and you happen to be in Australia and read the newspapers yesterday. Thank you very much. Uh, but nonetheless, the image on the left obviously evokes a far more stronger reaction in our little monkey brains in our head than the image on the right. In fact, the image on the right just makes you hungry. But Ultimately, that is a bigger killer on the right. So when you're laughing at a person running into the, into the sea thinking, Phew, they're going to get eaten by a shark, you're more likely to be hit on the head by a coconut and killed. We know this. We understand this. I think uh, Hugh Thompson in RSA a few years ago termed the, uh, the, the concept shark Mageddon. Everything, everything's overinflated. And you know, even, even when there was a, a shark crossing the Atlantic to, uh, you know, towards the coasts of Britain, it was followed on the newspapers you know, for, for days and days and images of it coming across, they evoke a strong response in people. And therefore, we overemphasize within, our, within ourselves the, you know, how risky that particular thing is. So let's bring it back home a bit. Let's bring it back into a little bit more of a fundamental perspective. Who here flushes the toilet with the lid up? Not the seat I'm not talking about, you know, the argument you have with your husbands and wives about, you know, you left the seat up again, you know, but I'm talking about the lid. Is anybody going to own up to flushing the toilet with the lid up? Right, okay. <coughs> Good, I'm glad, I'm glad that, because otherwise it would have been quite a short presentation. <laughs> so what happens, you know, you've, you've, you've done your business, what happens when you actually do flush the toilet? Well, the water from the pan aerosolizes and picks up contents from the toilet, basically the feces and the urine, and spreads it between 6 and 12 feet beyond the toilet. Okay? So many of you, as I'm sure I do as well, many of you will have a bathroom that has you know, a shower or a bath, a toilet, and a sink. What else is on the sink? Lovely. So many of you are brushing your teeth with a feces and urine laden toothbrush twice a day. Love it. Well, yeah, <laughs> and no, one, no wonder the British are known for their teeth. But, so here's the thing now, many of you may not have realized this, there's been a lot of you know, work on, involved in this and a lot of investigations, they've even done a, you know, a, 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 a myth debunker on TV and things like that. But the fact remains that it exists. It is a problem that exists. It sprays. And, it, and it's not just your toothbrush. It goes everywhere. Everything you touch, as it were. So 
you know, everybody who's gone to the toilet today and you've walked into the cubicle and the lid's up, good luck with that. So, therefore, I would imagine that many of you will probably start to change this habit. Not all of you. Some of you are very, you know, happy in your own filth. But many of you will go change this habit. It will close the, close the lid, put the lid down, and then flush. And it's, a, it's an easy habit to get into, and it works wonders for your marriage as well. You know. But let's put this into context. So a University of Arizona study actually looked at the number of germs that were on a variety of things, the number of harmful bacteria. And they found that with a toilet seat, there was 49 harmful bacteria per square inch. So that puts it into perspective of what's on that toilet seat. Puts in perspective, therefore, what's on your toothbrush. Probably your toothbrush is maybe, you know, half an inch square, maybe. So you've got 25 potentially harmful bacteria on your toothbrush. So just put that into perspective. Let's take, come out another go. They also carried on looking at other things as well. So your mouse. Well, that's got a few more harmful bacteria on it. Just a few more. Your keyboard has got even more again, okay? Not the one you've just opened, but the one you've been using for the last year. Your desk at work has a few more. Your phone has the most. So the next time you're having lunch at work and you're sitting at your desk, eating your sandwich, using your computer and using your phone, this starts to look a little less appetizing. You're actually eating within a very, you know, bacteria and harmful bacteria laden environment. Yes. The square inch, squares per inch of things go know. up exponentially. I don't know, but I'm sure somebody's going to fund a study into it. <laughs> they always seem to, right? <coughs> and I'll talk about it in next year's 44 con. So this starts to look a little less appetizing, and actually, before you know it, you're praying to the white, you know, the white porcelain god. Um, you know, and some of you may have been sick. You may have put it down to that, you know, dodgy curry that you had last night, Peter, or or whatever. But you know, it's probably just from something that you've been touching. So where does this leave us? This leaves us with almost what I like to I, I categorize this into three categories, of, three types of risk. So we have the perceived risk. This is the risk that, you know, hits us here in the heart, but actually our brains overcompensate. We actually know, we understand. The monkey brain works, you know, put, goes to one side, and the human brain comes forward and says, it's okay, don't worry. Then you've got hygiene risk. This is the risk that you're going to fix. You know, like I say, I, I would guarantee that many of you will probably start putting down your seat when you flush the toilet because of what we've heard and you know what happens and it's poo and wee, right? Who wants to deal with that you know, on, a, on a daily basis brushing their teeth? It's a hygiene risk, but comparatively, it's actually quite a low risk when you look at other activities because when you come to this risk, it's an actual risk. There is a far higher risk of you getting ill from eating your sandwich at your desk than, not, than flushing the toilet with the lid up. But again, I imagine many of you will probably still put the lid down. So our perception of risk is actually incorrect. We, we categorize things as risky when actually they're not risky, and we categorize things as not risky when actually they are. So what hope does that give us when we actually come to risk assessments in a business? How do you actually know you're measuring the right risks? How do you actually know you're looking at the right things? So, <clears throat> and we'll, we'll look at the takeaways at the end, but. You need to try and to overcome that little monkey brain occasionally in your head when you think you've, you've, you've got a risk. You need to actually rationalize it a little bit more, look at it a bit more intensely. So are you saying we need to become far more transparent? Uh, why not? With, with your phone outside. With your phone outside, yeah. absolutely. I you know, and, you know, I've got a stack of baby wipes here that you can clean your phones with afterwards. You know, don't worry about it. Yes? pleasantry of being stuck in Gartner for two days at the beginning of the week. <laughs> and Stuck in where? At Gartner. Oh. You know Gartner? You know the people? You know, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you, you know, it's full, it's full of high-level executive yes. security officers and things like that. You'd be surprised at the amount of high-level executives that go to the, to, to the toilet and walk straight out without stopping by the sink. 
So what how does that affect risks in enterprise? I should have been speaking at Gartner, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. <coughs> so we know the measurement of risk. We know that this risk is bigger than the, the other risk. We know that eating sandwiches, etc., is a bigger risk than brushing the toilet and brushing your teeth with poo and wee. So where do we go from there? Well, a very good friend of mine and colleague, uh, a chap, many of you might know, uh, J Javad Malik, he wrote a book supporting the uh, CISSP uh, qualification. And <coughs> it was, it was a, a fairly sort of um, informal book supporting the 10 domains. And he came up with this, what I've termed the Malik Risk Model. It describes how we can measure risk. <coughs> so you measure against likelihood and impact. How, how likely is something going to be? How likely is something going to happen? What is the impact to you? So it measures, obviously, from ain't happening, possibly it's on to, holy crap. And then the impact, which goes, the impact to you, you know, if you're in a fight, for instance, will be, won't hurt, it's the best you've got. Ouch, holy crap. And then you've, you've got this very neat kind of categorization. You know, anything from, you know, it's not happening, it's not going to hurt, come on, let's have a swift arf and we'll be on our way, all the way down through, you know, get off him, Dave, he ain't worth it, and all the way down through to, you know, ambulance, please, which you can't actually see in the, in the bottom right-hand corner there. So <coughs> this is a very simple, fairly effective way of measuring risk. And you can, you know, like I say, you, you, uh, the lower and to the right, the further to the right and lower you go, the higher a risk is. So I took his idea, I, sorry, I'll rephrase that. I stole his idea and I reworked it and I added in a bit more granularity now, the granularity comes from the ISO 27005 standard for measuring risk, and I do like it. It's fairly approachable. It's fairly easy to understand, um, and business people like it because, it, well, for a start, it's written down clearly, and they, they get it. So I've changed it. So we've got an asset value in place now. The assets are my arms, my legs, my chest, my face, and obviously my testicles. That I've got. Those, the bottom ones are the ones I value most. They're the most thing, the things that I value most. You know, some of you may say my face should be probably low, higher up there, but that's fine. And then you've got a likelihood. We've transferred that across. Ain't happening, it's on. Holy crap. And then ease of exploitation. So how, how easy is it to do something? So if I'm a ninja, it's not easy to hurt me in a pub fight. If I'm a drunk ninja, you've probably got a fairly you know, medium chance of, of hurting me. Or if I'm just drunk, you're gonna get, you know, it's going to be very easy. And so you get a slightly messier but more granular idea of how to measure your risk. All the way around from, you know, have a word, mate, you know, easy. All the way down to, get off him, Dave, again, and let's have it then, and ambulance, please, cab 20, et cetera. So, you know, if, I, if, 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 if the likelihood is holy crap uh, and I'm drunk, this, you know, I'm, this is just an example, um, and someone's at going after my testicles, it could either be a very good night or it could be a terrible night because I may end up in the mortuary if it's going on. So the lower down and to the right you go. But you can also categorize what we call the risk appetite here. So if it's in green, it's kind of like, I'm happy with this. If something kicks off but it's up in there, I'm okay. And also, I'm a ninja, so it doesn't matter. But of course, as it goes down further to right, you're actually unhappy about that risk, the way you measure that risk. Yes. <laughs> we'll come to that. We'll come to that. Yeah, see so the impact. So, you know, this is just obviously an example. But we come to the thing of risk appetite. This is something that many, many companies really do struggle with trying to elaborate on. They don't understand their risk appetite. And sometimes it's, it's not without reason because actually measuring your risk appetite is difficult because it's a movable feast at the best of times. Right? Maybe, not, not, maybe not on a daily basis for a company, but certainly it may change from one country to another, from one, you know, from one culture to another even, from one office to another, for, for any sort of reasons. That appetite of risk will change. So therefore... If you're a young lad and you're up for it, then a trip to an A&E could actually end up being a, a nice end to the evening because you've had it. You know, we've had a good laugh, haven't we? If, like me, however, 
you're a moral, upstanding gentleman within the community, wife, two kids, etc. My risk appetite is a very different thing. You know, even a cheeky slap is something I'm really not looking for, you know, when I go out to the pub or go out drinking. It's just not for me at all. Your risk appetite changes. And so you need to understand when you measure how acceptable a risk is for you to deal with. Because one of the most underutilized, I find, underutilized mechanisms for dealing with risk is acceptance. Accepting a risk is actually a fundamentally good way of, of dealing with a risk. Because firstly, you're aware of it in the first place, and actually you understand the impact to the business, and you're happy to accept it because other benefits are in place. Sorry. Yes. Okay, I've got one thing, to, one thing to say to that. It's an example. I'm trying to be funny. Yeah. Measuring your assets correctly in the first place and how important they are to you. Yes, of course, absolutely. So, thank you for that. So, and here's, here's how it looks from uh, ISO 27005. They use numbers, zero to eight. Very simple, uh, and they use traffic lights, they use different colors, etc. People tend to understand that. Ordinal numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, etc. Great, that's fairly clear. There's a problem with that. So what is the problem with, with ordinal numbers? <coughs> well, ordinal numbers create artificial barriers. So if on a traffic light system you've got high, medium, low, or it could be 3, 2, 1, or it could be 8, 5, and 1, or whatever, it doesn't matter. You're creating these artificial barriers because nobody is going to say that everything is perfect and everything is green when they're reporting to the board. Why? Because uh, if something does happen, they'll get called up on it. You said everything was all right. Uh, they, if, if everything looks all right, they'll get their budgets cut because they're not, there's no need for any more investment. Damn good job. Jolly well done. Yeah? So nobody's going to use green. But then nobody uses red either because they don't want to get fired. They don't want to be seen as having done a bad job. So actually, the world just ends up looking a little bit amber. And even if you create e extra dimensions within that, you know, perhaps have a, a scale of four within this example, you have the amber that looks best for you at that particular time. So it's quite a difficult way of, of putting your message across if the other side doesn't work for you, if the other side doesn't understand you, I mean. And so, and then, all you've done is actually look at the risks that you know about. These are the risks that we know about, because these are the assets we know about, and these are the likelihoods and the impact, etc. What about the stuff that we don't know about? Many of you will know this, um, the black swan concept by, uh, by uh, Nassim Nicholas Taylor, who wrote a book on it. It's a very, very good book. I do, I, I've, I've enjoyed reading it. It does open your eyes somewhat. But a black swan event is a cataclysmic event that happens without any warning whatsoever, and yet in hindsight, you can look back and see all of the signs building up to it. So it's a totally unexpected incident. How do you even measure that? You don't. It's, it's very, very difficult to. So a quick question again for the audience. That, you know, which industry out there do you think probably does some of the, the, the most intensive and some of the best amount of risk management within their, within their industry. Who, who might that be? I'd say air, air traffic. Air traffic is That's one? Air, air traffic. Oil and gas. Yep. Oil and gas. I'd suggest, as well, casinos. All right? The house always wins, and it's all about risk. It's all about balancing those probabilities and making sure they win. They're all very good examples, don't get me wrong. It's just that it wasn't my next slide. <coughs> Perhaps I should have done a you know, more interactive thing. But <coughs> you'd think 
that casinos really have it buttoned up when it comes to risk. And to a certain extent, you'd be right. They, you know, it's very rare that you see a casino going out of business. Um, but you know, very, very well, uh, very well. Um, uh, their approach to risk management is very clear. It's very rigorous, and actually, they're very much focused on the money at the end of the day. However, and this came from the White Swan book, so you know, I won't take credit for finding this out. But in conversation with, with Taylor, it, it was, they found out that actually their, their three biggest losses in this particular casino were for things that they had no inkling of, and there was no way that they could have even planned for it. The, and there was a fourth one that nearly happened as well. So the first one was the uh, children of one of the casino owners was kidnapped. The casino owner had to dip into casino funds to secure the release. Doing so is illegal. The US government fined them millions of dollars as a result. You know, how, how can you even sort of see that coming down the pipe? The second one was there's a responsibility of the casino to notify the IRS, the American tax authorities, of any big winners. So presumably they can go chasing after them. The employee who was responsible for this in this particular casino inexplicably just filed them in a box under his desk, didn't post them at all, it just didn't happen. So again, there's a vast amount of fines, hundreds of millions of dollars, etc. You know, casino had to struggle as a result. The third one was Siegfried and Roy, magicians, performers. Now they had a tiger that they'd kept, you know, and they'd reared from a from a, a cub, and they, you know, it was very very familiar with them. They kept it for many many years. And you know, you may, some of you may recall it, um, the tiger actually mauled one of them on stage. And as a result, obviously, the whole show had to be canceled. There was hundreds of thousands of dollars of fees, et cetera, et cetera. And they were not insured for it. They were insured if the tiger leapt out into the audience and mauled a member of the public. But they weren't insured for the performers being uh, mauled. And the last one that nearly happened and would have had a similar effect was a disgruntled construction worker who was annoyed at the level of payoff when he was sort of medically retired, uh, stole some construction explosives and was strapping them to the pillars of the casino when he was caught. So totally black swan events, you could say. And you could kind of explain, you, could, you know, in hindsight, you could see it, <coughs> see it happening. So actually... The risk management that you do is, is all well and good, and I'm not taking away that, you know, I, I use that 27,005 model that I went through, and I, I find it useful, and it talks well to my board, and it talks well to my business. But just by doing that does not mean that you're safe. There are things that are, there are other things that are going to happen that you will have no idea how to deal with. Uh, and in fact, <coughs> and in fact, it's about understanding what those risks are and trying to see how they're going to uh, affect you. So for instance, risks also commoditized. 15 years ago, dis, uh, DDoS attacks were a black swan event. Very, very rare, didn't happen. Anonymous basically commoditized them with LOIC, their low orbit ion cannon, and now they're everywhere. They're on everybody's risk regi register. But that first you know, those first few uh, DDoS attacks in the early days, nobody even knew how they were coming about. That's going to keep happening. But those risks will continue to commoditize. You need to understand, is this black swan event actually going to continue to happen, or is it literally a one-off? Trying to appreciate that is, is quite challenging. So we come on to the last section, the treatment of risk itself. What do you do? You've highlighted the risks, you've done what you can, you understand there are black swan events, and we'll talk about how you can address those. You know, what do you do next? <clears throat> so when we treat risk, we always look at history. And what does history tell us? History tells us that stuff happened in the past, basically. Probably not, not much more than that. You know, hopefully military leaders learn how to run campaigns better. Uh, than they did in, the, say, the First World War and the Second World War. But actually, the Second World War was an entirely different type of war compared to the First World War. So you know, how can you actually transfer that real knowledge across? There are some areas where you can, obviously, medical advances and things. But you know, we look back at history and think we, we know what to do today. 
And yet today's environment is very, very different from the environment we're working. So let's take, and I'm going to be you know, deliberately you know, pushy here, but let's take antivirus. Who here has removed antivirus from their enterprise? No. And nobody will. Even though the head of Symantec, one of the leading organizations, said it was useless. We do, but we're doing it, and we keep doing it. One, because nobody wants to be the first one to do it, but because well, it's always been done this way. We always do antivirus. You know, there's plenty of other things that we could potentially be looking at, but if the head guy, Symantec, says antivirus is dead, you know, that's a bit of a Gerald Ratner moment, isn't it? Isn't that something that you know, we should be picking up on a little bit more? Should we be looking at this? But nobody's going to take it off. Nobody wants to take it off. And so... <coughs> This is a risk that I feel is appealing to our little monkey brains again. And there's a myth, or an urban myth, maybe it was a real experiment, I'm not sure. Some of you may have heard of it. With five monkeys in a room, sorry, chimpanzees in a room, uh, with a ladder and a banana hanging from a string. One monkey climbs the ladder to get the banana. All five of them are soaked in cold water. Monkey tries again, all five of them are soaked in cold water. They stop going up the ladder. They take one monkey out and put a fresh monkey in. That monkey tries to go up the ladder, and all the others start beating it up because they don't want to get covered in water. And then they take an, a different monkey out and put a different one in, and so on and so forth. Process repeats. At the end of it, you've got five monkeys who've never been soaked in water, but they will not go up that ladder because they have learnt from what's happened from, from their colleagues and what has happened before them, even though they have no idea why. They don't know why they're doing it. It's not to suggest that we're blindly installing antivirus on everything at the moment, but it's, it's something that's, you know, potentially it's a risk that we should be looking at in different ways. It's a risk we should be looking at to, to, uh, to treat differently. Yes? Yeah. I think so. I think so. That's a whole other talk. Security versus compliance. Absolutely. And I think compliance can very often be the downfall of security. Um, yes. Yeah. Even though you can deal with it much more effectively in other ways. So then we come to the Pacific island of Vanuatu. And so during the Second World War, uh, lots of troops in the Pacific, obviously, and fl planes used to fly over and drop supplies to the, to the troops. Sometimes those drops went astray. You know, they went into different islands and different places. And the locals, the, the, the indigenous people, they would find it, and they'd find these boxes full of food and building materials and stuff that they could use. And it was, it was like it was from heaven. They saw these things flying. They'd never seen a plane before flying above them, and then suddenly there's this bounty of goods in front of them. And they started to worship the planes as a god, and then, of course, the planes stopped coming. And so they decided they'd build their own plane, because if every time there was a plane, the gods would deliver these bounty, bounteous goods. And so you end up with this concept where, actually, they're, they're biased towards something. They, they, they're, they're looking at their history and saying, well, when there were planes, we had goods, so therefore, if planes are gone, we'll make our own planes. We'll make our own as an offering to the gods, and they will come back to us. You know, these are not stupid people by any stretch, but they're applying that same kind of logic that we, we apply as well today. This is my favorite as well. Um, you know, many, many organizations use laptop lock leads. Uh, I'm not going to talk about you know, my organization at the moment. I can talk to you afterwards when we're off camera. But, um, you know, we use laptop lock leads because we don't want our hardware being stolen. And it also, therefore, means that our data is not being stolen. What I can tell you that in my organization of 15,000 people, it would cost half a million dollars every three years to cycle through the, in lock leads. We've got about you know, maybe 10,000 people on laptops. It would cost half a million dollars in, in lock leads. How many laptops do you imagine were stolen from desks in daylight during that period? Not half a million dollars worth, I can guarantee you. 
you know, and we shouldn't be doing things like this because they impact on our productivity and our ability to be mobile, etc. We should be focusing much more on this, on encryption. And I'm sure many, you know, encryption's a bit of a, a table stakes now, right? Everybody's got encryption, but they're still using lock lead. And the lock lead is having a detrimental impact to how your, your people are productive. They're seeing it as a hoop they have to jump through for security. And they're giving, it's giving security a bad name as a result. And actually, this, the lock lead and your thoughts of you know, losing laptops, that's, that's, it's, a, it's a hygiene risk. You're kicking back at something, well, we, we can't lose laptops. Well, if, if your data's encrypted, it's, it's a non-issue. You know, the, 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 um, the, you know, all of the commissions, they don't ask for information. They don't ask you to notify them when you lose a laptop that's encrypted. They ask you when you lose data. So there's no need for it whatsoever. And you sometimes get this clash between causation and correlation. You sometimes get this thing that actually we have to do things because this has happened. But causation and correlation are two different things. Causation means one thing will result in another. A correlation just means there is a match. So therefore, according to this, the, uh, the amount of cheese you eat defines how many people will die by becoming tangled in bed sheets. And when you start looking at your risks in this way and actually, say, actually asking, is this, is, is this a causation or is it a correlation? It's a great website, I have to say, Spurious Correlation. Do go and take a look. And we actually need to, to, to question how we're doing this. So we come to a bit of a sticky situation. How do we actually respond to our risks? So we, 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 we log down the risks we know about, and we give them a number, maybe a, maybe a nice color as well, maybe a shade. Um, but then we know about all the risks that we, we, there's a bunch of risks that we don't know about. The, 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 the black swan risk. How do we actually deal with this? How do we treat that sort of thing? Well, actually, the table stakes are you still need to treat your, your, the risks that you know about. You still need to do stuff with them. But you also need to have this flexible incident response capability. You cannot think that because incidents are not happening that your risk mitigation is working. That's a placebo. All it means is an incident hasn't happened. So you have to make sure, you have to sort of close the, close the, the approach so that when, you're, you, when you measure your risks and you mitigate your risks, that you also then have a, something in place when it all goes to, to hell, when it's holy crap moment, when something really starts to go wrong. And incident management is a very clear and simple form of risk management at the end of the day. You're trying to reduce the impact of something. If the likelihood has gone from zero to 100 or whatever, from ain't happening to holy crap just overnight, which is what a black swan does, you need to, to respond to that and you need to you know, reduce the impact of it through your incident management. So incident management needs to tie very closely into risk management. So, we're on the home stretch, takeaways, my gifts to you. Apart from the air from my lungs, I, br I bring three gifts that you can take away with you. <clears throat> so takeaway number one, I think, you know, I've said it a few times, just recognize and understand the difference between a hygiene risk and an actual risk. We all know perceived risks, we can deal with that. But recognize the difference. When does it really matter? Do I need to lock my laptops up, or am I just, having a knee-jerk reaction. It's a fairly simple one. When you actually start to analyze your motives for, for dealing with the risk or the, the way that you're dealing with the risk, you might start to understand or start to appreciate that there are differences between those. The third one is, sorry, the second one is, you know, try and spot patterns in your risks over time. What's become a commodity? What was something that you are handling at an incident level two years ago, but is actually happening so often that you should be doing something completely different? not just responding to an incident. You know, so what's the black swan and what's the pigeon? What's the commoditized thing and what's the thing that's probably never gonna happen again? Because if it becomes more commoditized, you need to deal with it now. You need to deal with it in a different way, not just in an incident response uh, approach. And the final one is, just because a risk hasn't been 
mitigated, sorry, a risk hasn't been mitigated just because it hasn't happened. It just means that an incident hasn't happened or, or something hasn't happened. It doesn't mean it's gone away. Risks do not go away in that kind of sense. You need to understand whether or not you're suffering from the placebo effect of everything's okay, we're fine, or actually you're just lucky and something's going to come and hit you tomorrow and how are you going to deal with that? So on that note, uh, I'm going to stop there. I'm happy to take more questions in a moment. Uh, but if anybody wants to continue the conversation outside, I'll be here this evening as well. You can also co contact me at any of these internet residencies of some description I'm, uh, online as well. So thank you very much, and I'm open for questions.